welcome to episode nine of the Microsoft Spotlight podcast with me, Andrew Price, and my co-host, John Jarvis. This episode is proudly sponsored by BitTitan. Check out their website today to find out BitTitan can help you migrate your data to the Microsoft Cloud. So, John, we'd like to introduce our guest today. Yes, today we have with us Anna Shu, who is the Senior Product Marketing Manager at Microsoft. So, Anna, introduce yourself, please. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me, John and Andrew. My name is Anna Chu. Uh, I am based here in Seattle, Washington. Um, and yes, I am the a senior product marketing manager specifically in the Microsoft 365 space, but I do a lot of work with the community, which is how you both know me. Um, I do a lot of work for the Microsoft Tech community, which is an online community platform. And uh, I've done a lot of work to support Microsoft Ignite, Microsoft Build, which are flagship events in the Microsoft calendar. Awesome. I say, like, we actually met um, quite a few years ago. Obviously, that's when uh, the tech community was basically first kicking off and basically first going out there. So, um, just want to tell us a bit more about the, the tech community. Obviously, now it's quite a, a large thing. Obviously, it started off being a very small, um, closed community, including mm -hmm. all the MVPs, and then obviously, then went out to the, the wider world. Yeah, yeah. If you want the full history lesson, uh, let me try and give it to you in a couple of seconds. <laughs> um, we launched the Microsoft Tech community in September 2016, uh, but previously it was called the Office 365 network, if anyone remembers that. It was an external Yammer network. Yeah, and I remember that. That's quite, that's yeah. going quite some time now. I remember that too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great, um, but it got to a point where we had 80,000 members. We weren't really seeing a lot of growth. And we also felt that uh, it was time to expand the scope with a lot of people asking questions about business applications and Azure, but we really didn't have the engagement from the Microsoft people from those respective products to actually answer those questions because it was the Office 365 network. Um, so the time had come to think about looking at a larger uh, platform, not so much larger as much as it was an open, more open platform uh, that allowed for people to lurk. Uh, if you, if anyone knows online communities, about 90% of your visitors come from people who are just browsing, not logged in, trying to get some information, usually just trying to find answers to questions that they have. And if you try and uh, you know, prevent people from accessing that from a, any type of paywall, even if they don't have to pay anything, just even by giving away their uh, contact details, I don't really, really feel as compelled to do that. So uh, we decided, you know what, let's move to a, a platform that allows for unauthenticated viewing, uh, that allows for SEO to index the, the results of the community and for individuals to find the answers that they're looking for. Um, so we, you know, went from a community that was 80,000 members strong, we're in excess of 600,000 right now, um, as of today. And uh, if I look at our numbers, like we range from 7 million to 8 million who come to the website every month, that's unique mm -hmm. visitors. So, you know, we that really shows us that we made the right decision in terms of bringing the whole online community to an unauthenticated platform and allowing for uh, people to just, you know, find it through any search engine of their choice. So, yeah, that's the tech community. We have taken the tech community to many different places as well. And we have currently seven languages that are part of our language translation AI. And... Um, yeah, it's it's been growing from strength to strength. So I'm really proud of the work that we've done. Awesome. So how did it all start? How did your um, IT career, career in IT come about? Yeah, that's a funny story. Um, started from the bottom. I started as an intern. Uh, I started as an intern in Microsoft Australia. Um, that was a very, very long time ago. Um, and uh, I started in the uh, as a GP product marketing manager. I don't know if you know our Dynamics products, but GP was Great Plains, and it was a product that Microsoft had acquired, uh, just like every other ERP product that Microsoft has. And uh, I, my first job was to manage customer evidence for our ERP programs. And as a fresh grad from university, I had no idea what ERP was. It was just three letters of the alphabet as far as I was concerned. Uh, first thing I did when the job 
you know, came to my uh, attention. I was like, well, okay, let me figure out how to buy this thing. There was no FPP. There was no like fully packaged product for you to like go and buy it at the store. My only knowledge of Microsoft was really like Microsoft Office and Windows. That was it. Um, so I really got thrown into a world of commercial, uh, you know, licensing and um, and talking to business decision makers through this role. Uh, and but I also really uh, had this. <laughs> this is also the time when Microsoft didn't have the big, the strongest brand. If anyone remembers Microsoft Vista, Windows Vista, <laughs> <laughs> who, can, who cannot remember Microsoft Vista? And also, I'd say ME it was a nightmare. Like, ME was terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was not the strongest product, um, and I'm, you know, I'm sure a lot of you know great teams worked on that product, but it just wasn't a, a, an appealing place to work. So I thought, oh, you know, I'll, you know, work at Microsoft for a couple of years, do my internship there, and you know, see where it takes me. It'll be good, like you know, resume stuffer. But here I am, almost 15 years later, still here, and I now work at headquarters. Um, but yeah, it was quite a transition. I, I spent five years in the subsidiary, uh, doing a lot of work uh, in the marketing space. Went from uh, Dynamics product marketing in, and then uh, SMB. Uh, managed to, you know, manage a telemarketing, a tele, tele, telesales center uh, that was based in the Philippines while I was there. Um, so, you know, that got, gave me a little bit of a taste of like international travel as well, which was kind of fun. Um, but ultimately, uh, I felt that I wanted to do a little bit more work that would allow me to build strategy for the company. So I gave it a shot, uh, moved to the States in uh, 2013 and have stayed there ever since. I also gave myself another two years sort of deadlines like, oh, you know, I'll give it two years and if I like it, I'll stay. If I don't like it, I'll just go back to Australia. Um, but yes, I'm still here. <laughs> so, so you obviously um, like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The TLDR on that is that it's 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 fun. It's a lot of work, um, but I get a lot of fulfillment from from being here, and uh, I think I'll still be here for a little while. So we'll we'll see uh, where my journey takes me. Are you a lifer then, Microsoft? I don't know. I I honestly feel like um, I've spent a lot of time here. Um, I sometimes question whether you know I should have some, a little bit more diversity on my CV. Um, but the thing is, like, I really enjoy the culture at Microsoft. Everyone is very collaborative. Um, there are a lot of people that you can meet through this through this company. Um, I, you know, can connect to someone like Jeffrey Snover, who's like the the inventor of PowerShell, or I can talk to Jeff Tepa, who uh, is the is the father of SharePoint. Um, and really, uh, I've it was so funny, like I, the way I've seen that those products evolve, and now um, there's a lot of talk about you know employee engagement through Viva. Um, there's there's always something new coming around the corner, and uh, I really love you know being the person that connects the community to uh, the people who create the products and vice versa. There's a lot of great conversation that's happening, a lot of great input that we get from the community. And you guys keep us honest too. You give us a lot of great feedback. Um, sometimes the, the feedback is uh, a little unfiltered. A bit too honest. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I have to play the role of, hey, you know, especially our MVPs, love our MVPs. I have to like tell our product marketing managers, like that call is actually really good, even though it felt like really harsh feedback. But, you know, I have to like, you know, encourage them to, to, to come back to the community sometimes when the feedback is a little harsh. But for the most part, um, I think our community does a really great job of uh, making it a very collaborative exercise when it comes to, uh, you know, sharing feedback as well as being our advocates. A lot of you end up sharing uh, the stage with us on uh, virtual events and also hopefully soon in-person events uh, when it comes to sharing best practices. I really like to think of, you know, the community as providing the um, sort of the real trade secrets, whereas uh, Microsoft is more about, you know, showcasing the, the theoretical way of uh, using our products, right? But you guys tell us, uh, how it applies in the UK with, you know, uh, specific GDPR restrictions or um, for specific industries. So, you know, having that additional flavour um, really makes the, the products real, especially to our customers who want to hear uh, real life user scenarios. Okay. So, um, so obviously, you know, you're talking very passionately about obviously your time at Microsoft. Yeah. But 
why did you apply for Microsoft? What I mean, what got you into you know the world of IT? What was it something they did at school? It was just basically you're looking for a job and this advertisement <laughs> came up for Microsoft. I mean, you know, our goal is obviously to share people's stories and obviously mm -hmm. inspire other women to get into IT. Uh, obviously, yeah. you're not from a, a technical background. You're more obviously, you know, the strategic side. So, you know, yeah. what made you, you know, apply for Microsoft? Yeah, interesting question. I Microsoft was not really my first choice. Uh, I graduated uh, from um, with a Bachelor of Commerce, uh, majoring in marketing and tourism and hospitality management. Um, and this is, I kind of realized early on that the tourism side of things was going to be very volatile as an industry. Um, in Australia, you know, uh, the tur tourism industry is a really big source of um, GDP, obviously, um, but it is fraught with danger, as we all have experienced with the global pandemic this year, uh, or back in the day, was terrorism. Right. So um, I just felt that from a career perspective, the longevity was really on the marketing side. And so I was looking more at the, you know, fast moving consumer goods industries, um, but they were very, very competitive. And, you know, companies like Google and Facebook were really starting to come on the up and up. So I started exploring um, roles in tech. Uh, but, you know, they were, you know, very hard to come by. But ultimately, you know, it was Purely by chance, I ran uh, into a university notice board that had this internship role. The role that was advertised was for what used to be called the DPE department. And I don't know if anyone remembers what that is, but essentially it is de developer relations, uh, what it was at the time. Um, the day I called HR, they had just filled the role, but then they uh, told me about this role in Dynamics. I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. I, I just want to get a job. I just want to be paid. I just want to put a foot in the door in the industry. I don't care what it is. Just, you know, let's let's schedule that interview. And which is why I was like, okay, what the hell is Dynamics? I have no idea. Um, and did my rudimentary internet research into what Microsoft Dynamics was. I was like, okay, well, you know, Manufacturing software, CRM, um, yeah. So it's I was very everything now, isn't it? Dynamics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, it really did. The thing that really uh, got me was the interview. The interview, I, I didn't know what to expect. I was really expecting, you know, a bunch of very socially awkward people to be interviewing me. But I was highly impressed by how smart everyone was, how genuine they were, um, how family-oriented the company seemed. It was blew, blew me away, really. I really did not expect um, people to be so welcoming. Um, so that really endeared me. And I basically got the role on the ride home. Like, I was just driving home, and then they gave me a call saying, yeah, they want to give you an offer. I'm like, uh, okay, cool. So when do I start? Um, it was very quick. Um, and... Uh, I the reason why I stay in tech is because of all the opportunities it offers me. Um, I am in marketing now and I've been in marketing uh, my entire career, but I could transition to an engineering role. I could transition to finance and I could really see myself, you know, being a all rounder in terms of, you know, understanding the business. But it really comes down to, you know, what drives you and what makes you what what are you passionate about? I'm really passionate about product. Uh, and I'm really, and that really is the center of what Microsoft is as a company. We are nothing without our products. Um, so I'm, you know, starting to consider, you know, moves to engineering, but I could also explore uh, people management as well. I've done, um, I've, I manage a team, I manage the uh, Microsoft tech community team, and uh, I've got a fantastic group of very talented individuals who are all very passionate about community. And I've done a lot of work to make sure that they feel very fulfilled in their roles um, to the point where I'm like, you know what, like if you wanted to explore a role internal to Microsoft, like go nuts, because I think I really believe that the, the work that you've done is going to bring a lot of value to your next role as well. So, um, yeah, like I, I, I fell accidentally into tech. Let's just say that I did not intend to be in tech, um, but I'm so glad it was a happy accident because you know I would not want to be in any other industry right now. I'd say eight, eight out of ten of our guests so far have accidentally fell into IT. It seems yeah. to be the um, the common the common um, subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I've got a question. So, um, 
But obviously, with your role, I mean, have you ever faced any challenges within it being a woman and obviously off from a you know, from a diverse background as well? Oh goodness, yes, this has definitely been top of mind for me. Um, we recently just uh, had. Um, uh, Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month here in the U.S. It's not something that's celebrated uh, outside of the U.S., but it certainly made me um, think about my experiences in my career, uh, at, usually as the only person of colour in the room. If I think about even my first meetings as an intern at Microsoft, yes, I was usually the only woman and I was usually the only person of colour. Um, and I, when you are also super young in career, that's another element to add to it. Um, you just want to make sure that you're not doing a crap job. You want to make sure that you are delivering value from day one. And so you always feel like you have to consistently prove yourself. Um, and I still feel that today. I still feel like I need to, um, you know, qualify myself. Like, you know, I look fairly young uh, as well, but I've been in this company for almost 15 years now. And people will be asking, like, did you start in kindergarten or something? They're like, no, I, I, I'm legit. Like, I Went to university, I qualified, and uh, and here I am. And um, so there's a lot of that. Um, but the funny thing is, is that when I moved to the US, I felt like because I was kind of a novelty because of my accent, <laughs> people were like, oh, actually, she is kind of different. Um, but she does have a, like, it, it seemed that people were more interested in what I had to say because I was not something that they were used to. Um, so I kind of leaned into that and used that to open a few more doors to me. Um, I definitely felt that, you know, people were more uh, interested in my ideas once I moved to the US. And I will say this, I think a lot of that was because I had created quite a strong brand in the Microsoft Australia subsidiary that was all tailored around my uh, heritage, uh, starting as an intern, ultimately becoming a graduate hire. And for me, and it's no, no fault of, of the individual, but someone, um, you know, uh, cornered me at a, at a conference saying, hey, you know, how are you doing in your graduate program? And I had left that graduate program three years prior. And so that told me that, Unfortunately, you know, some people can never forget that, you know, I was a, a young starter and that would always uh, prevent me from really getting promoted. Um, so I felt that I had to put myself into a more, not necessarily a more senior position, but just come out of a particular environment where that was my brand uh, and be able to start fresh and, and create my own brand on my own terms. So reinventing yourself to, to, to reach higher another job. Yes, exactly that. Yeah. And I strongly encourage anyone uh, to do that, you know, uh, especially if you still really believe in the company you work for, like maybe work in a completely different department. Um, but, you know, there is something to be said about your network, too. I will say that my network is a lot stronger in, in corporate. Um, I've managed to talk to a lot of different people in lots of different departments. Um, and even because the tech community stretches beyond Microsoft 365. It allows me to connect to people who work in the Azure space, the Power Platform space, um, developer relations, all that type of thing. So um, even the event side, uh, you know, I get to work with people who are, you know, essentially like television producers because of the work that we're doing with virtual events now. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I really feel that um, these last 15 years have helped me understand the core of what really drives me. Um, and for me, it's really around the community and the customer. Uh, I really felt that, you know, in this role in particular, I've never been more closer to the customer. In previous roles, I've always, always at arm's length. I was behind the scenes, um, you know, planning campaigns or doing research to better understand, you know, what kind of customer stories would be put out there. But I was never really in the throes of understanding what was uh, top of mind for our community, you know, what they were curious about, what challenges they were facing. Um, so, yeah, I've been really rewarded by by these roles in the last few years. Awesome. So as a, as a hiring manager, um, how many hmm. women do you see apply for roles within, you know, your team? Oh my goodness. Well, I am really lucky that um, I've got quite a diverse team. Um, I've got, let me think, I have 
three, four, four women. In, yes, I've got four women in my team now, and, it, and it's a team of five, uh, nine um, in my developer team. So um, the team that sort of uh, builds on the Microsoft Tech community, uh, all my developers are women. Uh, so that's that's really amazing, and that's got a lot to do with the my my technical lead um, making sure that we're you know really driving diversity, um, and yeah, like it's actually interesting from a culture perspective um, what that does. Um, we really feel like you know we're a lot more open in the way we converse with each other, and I think we're also uh, a lot more um, human oriented, I guess. Like we're, we're I, I don't know if it just happens to be the individuals that are in the team, but, you know, I uh, was really happy to actually um, hang out with my team the other week for happy hour in person for the first time because we're all fully vaccinated now. Um, and it was really nice to, you know, see how people were doing and, you know, get to find out what's been happening with their pets. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, like I, I really do appreciate my team uh, and get to know them as individuals. So, you know, the diversity in my team is uh, as much as I, I really don't know whether it was by design or it was just because we had this desire to create a very diverse team from the get go. So um, but nonetheless, I really feel that, you know, we have a diverse team. We've got a really strong allies. Um, I feel that our individuals in our teams can show up as their authentic selves without covering, um, but certainly that's up to them uh, and their personal preferences and how they want to show up. Yeah, one of the things I got from um, the last Ignite session was um, a, a team within Microsoft had never met each other. I think it was a, it was a, a bunch of like eight, eight or so um, co-workers and none of them had met, met each other. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We're now getting to the stage, hopefully, where we we start to start to actually see each other in the near future. Oh, so many people have started um, working in new teams that have never physically met before, and I'm pretty sure. And actually, I've even um, known people who've joined my organisation who hadn't even uh, stepped into campus because they just they're new to the company. Andrew That's... hasn't there his place. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I joined Fujitsu literally the week after the first lockdown in the UK. So I've not actually physically met any of my colleagues at all since wow. joining. So it's yeah. been like over a year now. I've been basically working with all these people online through Teams and on video calls. And so I've not actually physically met anyone. I've met my, my line manager because he lives like, you know, about half an hour from me. So we actually came and sat in my garden and had a bit of coffee. But yeah, my actual team that I spend most of my time speaking to, you know, I, I feel like I'm known as my, as my friends, but I haven't actually physically met them because most yeah. of my friends, but... So when we have that first meeting, it's going to be so weird to be in a room with lots of people that I've seen on video and not actually you know, have that initial connection. It's going to be, I mean, oh. uh, we, we, hired, we hired someone in, De in December and uh, me and one other person in the team, the only two people who met him, the, the other person's because they used to work together and me because I bumped into him at Ignite um, on tour in the February before lockdown. So we hired him nine months after I met him at Ignite. <laughs> <laughs> You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of um, all the events that we used to do back when we used to travel. And um, I would, you know, go to London or be in some other place. And people would come up to me and say, hey, Anna, how's it going? I'm like, uh, oh, yeah. And I have to do the quick, like, look down at their badge to <laughs> uh, figure out who this person was. Um, but, yes, it's kind of similar because, like, you have known this person through social media, through an, an avatar or a Twitter yeah. handle, and then you meet them in real life. You're like, oh, yes, John, hi. Good to see you. <laughs> you know, how's everything? Um, but, yeah, it is it is it is kind of a, a strange, un, not uncanny valley, but it's just, like, there's this disconnect. But once you get to meet people in person in real life, then you really start to yeah, uh, sure. engage with them differently. Uh, and especially going back to, you know, meeting them online um, or uh, meeting virtually through di di digital events, you know. So, yeah, it's it's. I realised that that was actually not... Um, not unlike, you know, the whole, you know, having to work virtually and never meeting your colleagues. Yeah, I, think, I think we're quite lucky because I think we're probably like the, I mean, I, I think I certainly am the new part of the generation are used to talking to people online. So even back when I was a 13 year old young man talking to people on MSN Messenger, and I'm used to talking to people <laughs> on 
online. Yeah. <laughs> and so one thing, one thing about Christian later, Nelson, later, Mr. Yeah. Is, uh, the nudge feature. I mean, that would be a great feature in Teams sometimes when you're trying to talk to a colleague, you know. So like the, the, the knocking hand on the screen, you're like, you know, wake up, what is this feature? Oh, I tell you what, I'll tell you one of my pet peeves on Teams is when, <clears throat> actually, this has got nothing to do with Teams as much as just it's uh, Teams etiquette. When someone IMs me and just says, you know, hello, or got a question, I have a question for you. It's like, just tell me what it is. Like, I don't have time to dilly dally. <laughs> I would much rather you just get straight to the point so I can give you the answer and I can move on with whatever else I was doing, you know? Um, can I have two minutes of your time? I was like, well, just carry on. <laughs> yeah, just tell me. I'll tell you whether I have two minutes or not. <laughs> so, so um, Anna, would you say you've got any like um, real like big career highlights? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, any one of the Microsoft Ignites that we did, uh, the big ones, which happened to be, you know, in either Orlando or Atlanta, were huge. Uh, launching the tech community back in 2016 was absolutely a highlight um, because it was really tough. Like, nobody knew what it was and you had to start from scratch. Um, so we had a big presence on the show floor. We had to recruit a lot of people. Um, and, yeah, it, it was definitely a tough struggle for the first two years of uh, launching the tech community. But now, you know, if I look at my inbox, there's always someone trying to launch a new community or a new product or a blog uh, with us. And I don't have to. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's certainly been a highlight um, for me. Uh, it's always a highlight when I get a chance to interact with community one on one. Um, right now, I have to, you know, um, do everything virtually, which is still fine, but I really miss meeting people in person mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just having a chat over a coffee or a beer, um, getting to know people and, uh, you know, meeting them in person is, is really fulfilling and giving people opportunities. Um, uh, I really love the call for content process that we do for Microsoft Ignite and Microsoft Ignite the tour. Um, I love going through every single one of the submissions and, you know, getting an understanding of, you know, what are the things that they are specifically are passionate about or specific types of expertise that they want to showcase. Uh, I love what we did recently for Microsoft Build and Microsoft Ignite were these table topics. And uh, I was receiving all these submissions, many of which, you know, I knew I couldn't give them each as an individual session, but I realized there was an opportunity to get multiple or different people who may or may not have collaborated with each other to, to work together on a table topic. There were only 30 minutes. There were just teams meetings, kind of like birds of a feather sessions. Um, and I found that really great because, you know, right now we don't have a lot of opportunities to uh, get people who, uh, you know, uh, let's just say they're both Microsoft AI MVPs um, to actually collaborate with each other on a flagship event. And so uh, giving people opportunities through community through these events uh, has been really great in the last year or so because, you know, we all miss, uh, you know, human connection. So we have to mm -hmm. settle with what we've got uh, with our virtual event trend. Yeah, I can't so wait things I've just events. done. Yeah. So one of the things I've just done for like me and John is basically submit a session for a local conference where basically we'll you know, we do a panel discussion for women in tech, just so mm -hmm. you know we can carry on our, our message from not just from this podcast, but also you know into an in-person event as well. Because as I say, there's a lot of women out there that you know work in IT, they're very much mm -hmm. a fan of Microsoft M365 Azure, and yeah. just don't get that time or that that's airspace to basically you know just share their stories so you know mm. that's why i've basically submitted that session because you know i want to you know carry on this podcast for as long as it as long as it can go on for basically you know yeah. try and help promote diversity equality inclusion for you know everyone really mm. yeah that's really awesome i i think that is um it's really amazing that we have people like you who are allies who are giving people opportunities to share their voice and, uh, you know, showcase their authentic selves because that gives other people more permission to say, hey, like, you know, uh, even though I may not look like these individuals that I see on screen right now, but they are give, offering, you know, someone else who looks a lot more, more like me an opportunity to speak and qualifies. Um, I mean, let's just think about the, the next generation of people who are going to go into tech. A lot of girls just think, you know what, like computer science is for boys. And 
and they usually the only girl in the room who's going to a computer science class and then uh you've heard so many stories of women who've ultimately opted out of computer science degrees or engineering degrees because they felt like they didn't belong in in class so you know we really need to provide uh, people with examples of people who have been successful, who are people of colour, who are women, who are trans, who, uh, you know, all people from all types of different backgrounds um, because there's no, you know, like just because of the way you are born or how you uh, look to, to the world should not really qualify you for a particular profession. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really important for people to hear these stories. Uh, right now I have an a intern working for me, uh, spending this, his summer with us, and he's really passionate about the black community. So, you know, in my conversation with him, um, I, I we talked about community and how it was really important to hear different voices. So I sent him on a project to amplify black voices in tech uh, through the Humans of IT blog. So uh, coming up, we've got a, uh, in, in the US, we celebrate uh, an event called Juneteenth, which is about the emancipation of slaves uh, in the US. And we're going to launch a blog series on the humans of IT community about, you know, black voices in tech. So all I did with uh, with my intern Skylar was tell him, okay, I know two people. I know uh, April Spate and I know Aisha Brown. They're both in the developer relations uh, organization. Uh, they're cloud advocates. Uh, they're both, you know, uh, really loud black voices in the community. And they basically, each of them just uh, gave him a whole Rolodex of different people that he could um, talk to. And now he's got a solid editorial calendar. There's 25 stories at the very least. Um, wow. But, you know, it's all about giving someone an opportunity to uh, do the work that they're passionate about. I knew that he would get a lot out of his internship if we, you know, tapped into, you know, his passion for his community um, and used it to um, hopefully, like, you know, even after his internship finishes in August, these these stories are going to continue um, uh, staying, you know, online for people to find uh, through through the web um, and realise, you know what, like, you know, it's as, as much as IT seems to be a white person job, it's not just a white person job. Like anyone of, of People, any people of colour can really qualify themselves and and um, and you know be uh, you know be a developer or an IT professional or be in marketing, but you know uh, be themselves as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so I mean, I've spoke before on episodes. Basically, my background, you know, I've got Irish heritage, I've got Jamaican heritage, so you know, I, I've come from a very mixed family group, and you know. Irish are big drinkers and obviously Jamaicans are big rum drinkers. So you know, I, I can handle my drink. That's, that's a good benefit from being from that diverse uh, background. But it's just, you know, I've never actually faced any like, negativity towards race when I've gone through my IT career. But, you know, I've got friends who have. Um, so, you know, for me, I'm quite passionate about it. And as well for like, obviously, I used to run a, a conference um, and getting like female attendees to come on board, female speakers was a massive challenge as well as obviously if I look back at my speaker list over the years, I think most of my speakers were Caucasian. I, I, don't, I can only remember a couple of, you know, people from a, the, the black community that actually, yeah. you know, had a session. So, you know, yeah. we have to do more as a community, yeah. as a group to basically get more speakers from all different backgrounds. Because obviously everyone has like, a different view, a different style, different yeah. outtake to, you know, everything. Yeah. Like, stuff than that, you know. Yeah. I, 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 I think that's amazing. And I think, you know, one of the things that people may say to discredit that that notion is that oh you know there's there's tokenism and we don't want tokenism we don't want to say you're getting this opportunity just because you know you happen to fit a particular uh, checkbox that we're trying to tick that's not what we're trying to do here we're trying it's not to about, it's not about box ticking it's not about quotas no. it's, it's basically no. you know, the best person for the best session really yeah yeah but also because they offer a unique perspective as well oh. um and the other thing that to keep in mind that if people are struggling to find, um, you know, diverse voices to be part of their user groups, etc., is you know, uh, leverage the network. But also, when you do find someone who, you know, let's just say a person of color, um, 
ask them, like, you know, is there someone else you think that, you know, from your community that, that is trying to learn or, um, you know, that you're trying to do you, you, that you think would, you know, benefit from an opportunity like this. So, you know, I think there's an opportunity for all of us to lift others up, um, not just think about, you know, um, I, I certainly feel that I'm uh, lucky that I am in a role that's all about lifting others up and giving them an opportunity. Um, but it's it's not necessarily a muscle that everyone uh, is used to exercising. So I I often feel like, you know, a lot of the network I'm building is not so benefit myself. It's more to benefit other people. A lot of the things that I do are around, you know, connecting people who may not know each other, um, but I want to give them an opportunity to, you know, work together, uh, deliver sessions together, um, as well as, you know, hopefully you find future collaborative efforts that have nothing to do with me. They've just, those two minds have come together and they've come up with a new, you know, podcast series or um, uh, a user group event. Uh, that type of thing. So, um, yeah, I think lifting others up is is a really p- big part of uh, allyship as well as um, helping others. So, talking about podcast, obviously, I know that you're a podcast host yourself. <laughs> I, it's it's been dormant for a while. I'll say that um, there's a lot of work that we've been doing in the background. That's like the podcast for me was a really fun uh, little jaunt that allowed me to um, amplify specific voices in the community. Um, I had spoken to a lot of really great people um, and it was also to support Microsoft Ignite the Tour when we were actually traveling uh, around the world. I had this really grand vision that I would um, interview uh, different people from every tour stop that I went to. So I interviewed uh, people like Lorraine Strand and his wife Megan um, when I stopped in Australia and then uh, interviewed the folks from South Africa as well when I was there. Um, but obviously we're not traveling anymore. Um, we're not doing any in-person events, uh, not for the foreseeable future. Um, so yeah, I haven't been doing the podcast thing for a while, but um, I am busy working on a few other things that are going to really change the way you engage in the tech community. Um, one of the things that we're planning on doing is something called Tech Community Live, which is um, the kind of going to be half day type of events that allow for the a particular community to be taken over. Um, meaning, you know, we could uh, we will have our product m- managers and, and engineers, you know, delivering live streams on the on the tech community, uh, delivering AMAs. We'll also give the community opportunity to deliver content and best practices, so everyone comes together for these tech community live events. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do in terms of ensuring that. Uh, we have the right experience in terms of driving people to engage and ask questions. Uh, we want to make sure it's super dynamic, but not be so distracting that it's hard to keep up with the the flow of the chat. Um, I'm certainly taken on a lot of feedback from the t- table topics that we did most recently. So uh, that's what I've been focused on. Not so much a podcast, but I would mm. really like to take that up again once I have um, once the Tech Community Live uh, has has taken off. Awesome. Go on, John. So you got a the- question now, John. I was going to say, so what are the um, the goals of the future in, in your career then? Oh, goodness me. Um, I, I, have a, I have a few things planned, but certainly the Tech Community Live piece is one. Um, I, I feel like, you know, I want to get closer to product. Uh, I've done a lot of what I do now is essentially a shared service across Microsoft. And I feel like I've achieved a lot of great things with it. Um, I still need to get try and get a few more products to come on board before I can fully say it's a, 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 a one Microsoft community because not every community is there. Um, but I also feel like maybe that's a battle that I can't really fight entirely because some people really like to own their fiefdoms, but uh, it's not it's that's not up to me. Um, but nonetheless, I really feel that I've achieved a lot with, you know, we've got seven to eight million people coming to the tech community every month. Uh, with over 600,000 members, I, I'm pretty pleased with the results that we have. But um, one thing that I'm considering is, you know, moving closer to product, potentially to engineering role, um, or um, maybe even exploring managing um, a team. Um, another you team. Hint, you hinted on the on the engineering role earlier, actually. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have nothing, nothing real just yet. I mean, these are just ideas that are floating in my mind. Um, I, 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you have uh, touched me on the shoulder for this podcast right at this time because I have been taking a lot of stock of what I've been uh, doing in my career um, so far and just thinking, you know, am I at a fork in the road? Probably. Um, I feel like I've done a lot in the marketing sphere. So, you know, maybe p- trying my hand at being a PM would be interesting. But who knows? Um, you might find me like doing something completely different. Um, so I'm in the exploratory phase of, of what to do next, for sure. Maybe, maybe we'll catch up with you this time next year and see and see what the last year is healthier then. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. I will be really excited to do that with you this time next year. <laughs> awesome. So with the whole being in Microsoft for 15 years, I'm guessing you very much enjoyed the whole entire ride from being obviously in the dynamics into the tech community. I mean, what drives you to like, you know, stay within the tech community? Obviously, I know you're speaking about you want to like move into like the engineer and potentially be a PM, but what makes it on a day-to-day basis, what, what are you actually doing to obviously keep driving that tech community? I mean, I know we had um, Laurie on a couple of weeks, a couple of episodes ago, and she was basically obviously reached out to you because she was trying to set up a, a community for Skype business at the time, which then moved to Teams. So yeah. what, what does your like, day-to-day role involve and obviously drives you every day? Oh, my goodness. For me, it's always about the community, like community lowercase c, meaning the actual people who we connect with, you know. Um, I I really want to make sure that we are, uh, at Microsoft, we are in a unique position where we're creating experiences for you all. And I am always cognizant of the challenges everyone's facing right now, being either in lockdown or um, just being fully remote. Uh, because of the current pandemic. Um, I am always thinking about the individual behind the screen and potentially feeling, thinking of the the worst case scenario where they're feeling extremely isolated, unsupported, uh, you know, being thrown in the deep end in their particular role and not knowing where to go. But when they go online, do a quick search to find out, you know, uh, how to deploy teams or whatever their problem is, they are hopefully stumble across a really thriving community on the Microsoft tech community, finding really great individuals who offer them, you know, advice without, you know, any agenda, like they just want to help. All they want to do is, you know, give them a potential solution that they can consider and uh, hopefully it works out for them. I am really uh, motivated by that individual who all they want to do is, is support, you know, the community, whether it is through the content that they create answering questions through the online discussion forums, providing feedback directly to Microsoft through our IDs exchanges. Um, They are very altruistic in their endeavors and they really care about, you know, our products. They also really care about the community. So for me, you know, anything that I can do to support those individuals is that they're ultimately doing a lot of work for us, but without having to, you know, not even being an employee, they're really just doing it from, uh, from a volunteering point of view. So, um, I want to always give them opportunities to showcase the expertise because they get a lot of fulfillment out of that. They get a lot of fulfillment in showcasing, you know, the knowledge that they have from the conversations that they have with other individuals to connect with other, not necessarily like-minded, but certainly people who are equally as passionate about the products. And, and I love seeing individuals, um, and be elevated to a new status. Like, for example, I saw people became MVPs most recently in the last couple of weeks. Uh, they were awarded uh, specific, you know, commendations from Microsoft to say, you know, your expertise and your feedback has been highly valued and recognized. And so we're going to give you an exclusive access to this organization that allows you to have, you know, confidential access to confidential information to uh, have be part of our inner circle of, um, of, of Microsoft. So yeah, that's, that's seeing the trajectory of individuals and their journey uh, in the last few years has been highly rewarding for me. So obviously I was an MVP for a good three years when I was running all my conference events and stuff like that before basically I stepped away from the program to you know, have, have a bit of a normal life and you know, buy a house <laughs> and you know, do other things. Um, that's great. Uh, and so recently I've been you know, renominated to become an MVP. So now I've got a call with our MVP lead in the UK um, next week to go through my you know, contribution. So hopefully touch wood, you know, I'll be back. Yeah. So from, the, from a community perspective, I mean, you know, we spoke about it at the start. 
you know, I spoke to a lot of people who are MVPs and it was basically great to actually have that physical in-person attendance to Redmond and obviously be at MVP Summit, see the campus and actually meet all these people that, you know, yeah. I've spoken to so many times and just nice to put a, a name to the face and yeah. especially, you know, I think everyone, um, whoever goes to like, Redmond knows about Joey's Bar and basically go in there and have a few beers. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's brilliant to, to basically have that, you know, that relationship. And there's a lot of guys now that I still speak to. Um, I mean, one guy I completely love is uh, Greg Sheridan, who's based out in the based out in Australia, and he's, he's, yeah. he's a good guy. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think obviously we are running uh, quite close to time, and obviously I know you're you're a very busy person yourself. Um, <laughs> I'm going to basically throw my little interview question out there to basically, as I do to most guests. Um, so if you didn't join Microsoft, what do you see yourself doing other than the career that you do now? Oh, gosh, if I wasn't at Microsoft. And that's a oh. tough question because it seems to be there for 15 years. <laughs> I know, I know. I can't even fathom what that is. Um, I probably would have found myself... Um, before I, I joined Microsoft, I spent a little bit of time in uh, magazine publication. I uh, was covering for someone who uh, went on maternity leave. Um, the couple of magazines, uh, there was one called Bride to Be, and another one called In Style Australia. So fashion oriented. Um, if and if any of you have ever seen The Devil Wears Prada, it is exactly like that. Um, you have. I you know, really any- don't like that movie. It's a brilliant movie, John. You know, you know, you know, I've watched it many times. I love it. it is exactly like that. Anyone who's in editorial is has all the glamorous roles and gets to do all the fun shoots and stuff. I was relegated to like the another department that was just not as glamorous. But the best part of that job was going through all the um, competition. Uh, submissions. So these were people who were trying to win like a fully paid wedding uh, or honeymoon or something. And uh, I had to go through all the submissions. And here's a pro tip for you all. Uh, If you want to actually be in the chance to win, don't just fill in the slip. Like basically bribe the other person who has to go through all the other things. I received like a custom cake that was like turned into (laughs) a letter. Um, Someone like did a fully hand-drawn like book. It was amazing. The creativity from people was just like wow so anyone who just like filled in a slip of paper with their phone number on it was like yeah you are not even in a contender like anyone who actually put in some creative effort to win to make a cake cake yeah for the heart of anyone right Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah they would definitely be more they they were definitely going to be uh in the short list at the very least um which is not to say that when it comes to call for content do not bribe me that was not gonna work for me (laughs) (laughs) I really need to make sure that you are a legit speaker and have the right expertise. But if you throw in a cake, it will help. (laughs) Maybe (laughs) I'll give you more of a look in, but... um, What about a few Tam Tams? They're they're quite quite nice. Tim Tams? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm running out of Tim Tams. I'm running out of Tim Tams, Vegemite. Uh, So, yeah, Australian viewers, uh, if you do want to bribe me, I will certainly consider your application maybe a little bit more. (laughs) But, you know, (laughs) that's not to say I will be bribed. Uh, But, um, yeah, I don't know. I think I probably would have found myself in media in some way. Uh, Would I have felt, you know, as fulfilled? Probably not. Uh, I would have probably had to do a lot of work to, um, gosh, like that's an interesting conversation, especially after the diversity conversation we had, because I feel like that's an industry where, you know, a lot more women are, um, are part of that industry but then you know I, I asked myself is that because I felt like I belonged in that industry more you know which is why I put myself out there and why I didn't really consider am I accidentally in tech because I didn't really think that it was a place for me yes I I would 100% say that I don't think that it was really a place for me which is why I gave myself like a two-year you know expiry date say, you know what, if I don't really feel like this is for me, then maybe I'll opt for something else. So, you know, but if anything, this career has actually told me and proved to me that it is a place for me, that I am highly valued, that my opinions matter, my ideas matter, and by being in this industry for 15 years um, just shows that it is a place for women, and if you are a person of colour, you absolutely can succeed. So, yeah. 
that's a great note to go out on, definitely. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Anna, I would like to obviously thank you for your time today. Um, you know, it's been insightful as always doing these episodes. So, I, I am loving more and more of it as we go through this whole entire journey. The stories that we were basically learning. Sometimes there's the same message over and over again, but obviously there's a different spin to it. And so, it, it's just brilliant to you know just to share your story. Yeah, I'm very happy to be part of your podcast. Thank you so much. And absolutely, the uh, offer still stands. If you want to have a chat to me this time next year, I would love to have a conversation with you both. Awesome. Wicked. Awesome. Right. Thank you very much then. So I'm going to basically wrap up this episode. So come back next time where John will be hosting and we'll see you for episode 10. Thank you for listening to the Microsoft Spotlight podcast. Please make sure you hit that like, share and subscribe button to help us promote our message. You can also follow us on Twitter at MSFT Spotlight and we're also on LinkedIn, the Microsoft Spotlight Podcast. And finally, we'd like to tell you a little bit about BitTitan and thank them for sponsoring this podcast. Remote migrations start here. Let MigrationWiz do the work for you. It's fast, secure, and 100% SaaS, which means you can migrate at any time and from anywhere. Migrate mailboxes, documents, public folders, personal archives, or even Microsoft Teams with just a few clicks. No special training needed and no customer downtime. When the work matters, choose MigrationWiz.